Wari kwanu hela dunika ika yotsa nunya chiganto de yungwa tla wani sla de. Jerry Hill ni yungya tso sluni geha. Kahun hadadi ni yungya tso ungwe hungwe ne. O kwali wagi daloda. Um, I said who I am and my clan. And uh, it's an, really a wonderful, wonderful meeting that we've been having uh, for the last uh, couple days. And it seems like it keeps getting better and I'm happy to see our uh, relatives from uh, across uh, Turtle Island to be here. And uh, I'm very uh, happy and I know uh, you are too to hear people use their language. And uh, a long time ago, I was always critical of coming to these meetings when we listen to some white linguists talk about the uh, analytical part of our language. And uh, as some of the people mentioned, that's an important thing. But more important than that is talking. And so each year, uh, each year we uh, come up with a different theme of immersion. And uh, we've been fortunate to have uh, Finley McLeod from Scotland and other people and, and uh, um, Chris Harvey too to uh, uh, show us about indigenous people in Europe. We don't think about that, but there's indigenous people in Europe. They have their own languages and they are under the same type of uh, homogenization from their colonial invaders who uh, try to change the language and they're still fighting back. And so for those of you that are staying for uh, uh, Finley's uh, presentation and workshop the next couple of days, you'll be nicely surprised that his perspective is about adult immersion for the purpose of reinforcing what we've kind of done is focus on children. So we've, uh, for a long time, we've had this idea that it can't be isolated to teach the young people and they'll grow up speaking. It needs everybody, everybody. And there's a lot of people in all our communities that are, um, they comprehend, but they haven't gone over to the side of speaking. We want to try and recover those people too. And in some places they've been able to do things like that. So what we've heard here uh, so far the last couple of days is something I'd also like to reinforce, and that's that um, conversation, home conversation, is really the basis of all communications. You learn how to talk with your family, whoever, you know, your caretaker, usually the mother, the house, the family, the community, wherever you go, it's spoken. And uh, that's conversation. Later on, when you become more sophisticated, you learn how to say prayers and you learn how to make speeches and talk people into things or talk yourself out of stuff. Uh, that's also communications. But um, I, I made myself a bunch of notes here just in case I blank out. And uh, you know, as a lawyer, I can kind of talk until your eyes get glassy. But um, I'll try to stay. Uh, on the subject of the PowerPoint that I made. I've never done this, I just, you know, um, talk. But this time I decided, uh, after working with my grandchildren, I said, you know, I want to uh, do something that will help them get involved. And I decided that I don't want to go to classes because uh, you have to get into a relationship with somebody before you can really communicate. And I said, it makes more sense that I would do that with my grandchildren because they already know me. So we don't have to be introduced and we don't have to figure each other out. They know how I am and I know how they are. Anyhow, I said, well, one of the things we could do is we would play this game called Yahtzee. And uh, I said, well, that even kind of sounds like an Oneida word, Yahtzee. <laughs> so anyhow, we get out to Yahtzee and I discovered that I don't know how to say I know how to say cup, but I don't know how to say dice. And then I don't know how to say two of them. And I don't even know how to say shake them and roll them out, but I do know how to say count them. So, you know, like this whole thing started off with, we will practice counting and then we'll practice your turn and all that. I had some of that, but when it came down to the dice itself, 
I didn't know, so I had to call my friend in uh, Canada. And I says, how do, how do you say dice? You know, he says, uh, Deglu Nadio Dagwalund. And uh, that means something with eight points. It's a square. And then I had this hot flash in my head. I says, wait a minute. He's describing this to me in 3D. Eight points, it's not flat. It's eight points, this square thing. Well, that's just one of them. How do you say two of them? So, and I got this language lesson on the phone and then put it in a cup and shake them up and roll them out and now we can count them. And I discovered in that little exercise how much I don't know. Simple things that you just take for granted I couldn't do. So I'm trying to get my game going and we made something of it, it was fun. But uh, the kids would look at me and uh, it was kind of embarrassing because I thought I knew something, but when they're looking at me, I know they want something more and I don't have it. Grandpa has nothing. And so I had to kind of like go back to myself and uh, I remember our discussions on the how-to book and other uh, discussions we've had and I'm thinking, I'm always arguing about words. I didn't like master apprentice. I didn't like um, those kinds of words because you know they were colonially based and things like that. And I thought, why do I keep doing this? I hated the word curriculum. Uh, one of my old teachers, he didn't want to be called a teacher because he never went to school. He wanted to be a helper. So those kinds of things made me uh, realize that even though I don't want to say curriculum, I have to do something that, you know, kind of uh, resembles a plan. And everybody who's a teacher in here knows that you can't walk into the classroom and ad lib for a whole semester. You have to have a plan. So I kind of had this uh, insight that no matter what you call it, curriculum, plan, getting ready, something, so that you're ready to go on with the next thing. Well, that's me talking about my notes. Now, when I was preparing this uh, PowerPoint, and uh, I made a lot of notes, not for the purpose of uh, reading them to you, but for the purpose of jogging my memory in case I start going blank, which, you know, happens from time to time. And uh, I have some young helpers, Alex is, uh, helped me set this up and my uh, clerk at home, she put it together for me. And you know, it's like, even with my uh, phones and computers and all that, I have to get somebody who's young to say, how do you do this? Or set this thing up and just tell me which button to push because, and don't explain. I says, if you start explaining stuff to me, I says, I don't know nothing. I says, I'll forget it as soon as you start talking. So just do it for me. Well, he's there as my, uh, in case uh, this thing that I'm trying to do uh, doesn't work the way I, I had it in mind. Um, I would like to go on. Um, the importance of conversation really can't be overstated. If you can't talk at home and if you can't talk with your family, I mean, who can you talk to? You aren't really talking. If you memorize something and recite it, well, that's saying something, but it ain't necessarily talking. To me, talking is conversation. It's where uh, you're talking to and somebody's understanding, and then when they talk back, you comprehend. That's what we mean is that, uh, or that's what I mean as I'm saying this. I'm talking about mutual exchange of information. There's other kinds of information, and uh, you know, policemen directing you to do something, politicians giving you persuasion, telling you why you should elect them. Um, even prayers have that place where when you're saying something, it isn't for a deviation so that you can ad lib, it's more like they're set speeches. You have to say exactly the same words the same way. Um, Dr. Joshua Fishman, uh, was telling me about his uh, father-in-law who is a rabbi and they read off the scroll and they have to read it exactly and he said when his father went blind or his father-in-law 
that he quit reciting even though he knew all the words because he's supposed to read them. That's part of that culture that they would know how to read because it's a preservative uh, of something that keeps them doing what they're supposed to do and reminding them of their responsibilities. And I think that's what um, we're doing here. We're reminding each other of our responsibilities and we hear it uh, from our speakers and from the people that are doing the questions and the breakout sessions and the, the discussions that we have. Um, we're exchanging information. We're asking for clarification. We're bringing up points of um, curiosity, things that we want to know. Well, that's beautiful. This is a beautiful meeting. I'm very happy to be here and uh, be a participant for some of that. So what I'm going to do is, uh, and what I'm doing, is um, I want to talk about things that people don't generally talk about. Uh, for example, when we're doing TPR, um, or talking about TPR, one of the questions I always had about that was, well, what about the emotional stuff? You know, TPR seems to me like things. You know, you can count things and you can say what color they are and you can describe them. But what about the other things? Because there are other things and you learn them uh, right away in your language too. And I'm thinking of a book I read in which, uh, I think it was called The First Word or something like that. It's like uh, the study of language and speech is really fascinating. You know, you want to say like, well, where does it start? And uh, this man said, it starts when a baby's born and looks at its mother. And uh, there's, no, there's no words for that. But there's something going on that gets abstracted into noise and then noise gets abstracted into uh, meaning until babies start talking. Well, part of what I want to say, and, and if this thing works right, um, I want to kind of point to the spirituality and a philosophy of uh, language in general and also the, um, uh, what I would consider the magic of speaking. You know, how do we know how to do this? One of my teachers uh, worked in daycare. He said he always talks to these kids in Indian. And uh, his routine was to bring up his box of stuff and it was the objects and he'd go through them and they'd repeat them after him. But when as soon as he walked into the room, he talked Indian. And he talked Indian to these kids for the whole time. And uh, in one of our uh, breakout sessions, some of the teachers were talking about uh, discipline and sassy children and things like that. And that's a, a definite aspect of school. You know, you can't have an orderly room if you've got uh, young kids competing with you for attention. And uh, in one of the classes that he did, uh, one of the teachers stayed in there and she knew all those kids and she spotted them when somebody started fussing around. She didn't move in and move them away to keep order. Some of the other classes he went to, as soon as he came in, they went off and took a break, smoke break, when he was there. He couldn't stay there very long. He could stay there 10 or 15 minutes, but he was not there as a disciplinarian. He was there as a... a somebody to share something because he loved his language and uh, he had respect for the language and during one of the times he was telling me about this he says um, he says um, our languages are dying that's a message we've heard up here that's something that uh, Chris went through yesterday or the day before with the domains and the explanation, and you could see how that happens. It's reinforced by whatever study you want, but you could see like the language is going down. And we're all here because we don't want it to go down. We want it to come back up again. So when we hear the language, we know how beautiful it is 
and anything you can say in any language, you can say in our language too. And uh, it might take a while, but there is no word for word translation and we don't want to translate anyhow. What we want to do is communicate the ideas that we have and what we're thinking about to somebody else, not for agreement, but maybe for uh, them to be stimulated to say something back to you or maybe correct you or something like that. So I would say like I, learning all this stuff from uh, these people, my teacher says, you know when he holds up a little baby, infant baby, he says, baby, that will look you right straight in the eyes. They don't mess around. They're just right in your face. And he says, they're there because they're interested in you. They're interested in what you have for them, whatever it might be. It's an emotional basis. So you talk to them and caretakers and moms always say loving things to babies. But as we get older, we say less and less loving things until, you know, when you get really old, like uh, somebody was saying, you build a wall around you. Um, you know, you're just full of poison and, you know, hatefulness and, uh, well, if he's going to the meeting, I'm not going, you know, or, eh, you know, you just brush everybody off. Totally uh, disrespectful. You're not open to the ideas or to the messages that are coming through. He says, but a little baby right in your face, they can't say anything. You can't explain nothing to them either. You can say, ooh, ooh, you know, quit crying or whatever. Uh, they're in your face, they wanna see something. And he says, as soon as they start squirming around, that means you ain't interesting anymore. Put me down, put me someplace where I can either rest or learn something or be around somebody who's more interesting than you. That's an emotional uh, communication, like moms and babies usually, but uh, other family members, whoever takes care of the infants, they have that communication. No words, but something's going on. To me, that's kind of an emotional connection that you need, it's like a trust. I mean, I think that babies know that you love them before they ever understand or be able to explain what love really is. Or I think of that sometime, uh, my grandma would listen to me when I was in law school and I'd talk about sovereignty. And uh, I always kind of got the feeling that she was letting me rave on because all that stuff I was talking about was really white man words for who we are and our identity. And she didn't need that. She could talk. She went to church. I used to be down on Christians and I thought, well, my grandma's a Christian. That means I have to be down on my grandma. I says, well, that don't work. So I had to be more tolerant. And I'd say, well, does it really matter where people go to church? Does it really matter that? And I thought, no, what matters is how you act and how you treat people. And so that was one of the things that I'm thinking, well, I can't explain to my grandma, even though she's quiet and she's listening to me, I'm sure she don't understand and she's probably proud of me for doing all this stuff, but it don't mean nothing to her. Later on, when I started going to court, I was up on the Menominee Reservation and I'm a public defender, and uh, I'm defending this guy who lived way back in the woods. He lived so far back in the woods uh, uh, when he was being tried for disorderly, which was an interesting story too. Um, I was looking at him and I said, you know, this guy doesn't know that he was terminated. And then he was restored. All went right by him. I says, that's sovereignty. He knows who he is and he knows where he's from and he ain't going no place else and he's gonna keep living the way he does. I says, that's being able to trust and rely on where you are. I says, that has a lot to do with it. Now, if you uh, go to law books and go to um, various of the uh, federal statutes, you'll see the definitions of tribes and Indians and people trying to get recognized and people uh, doing things in the name of law. <coughs> Excuse me. 
That's a big, long definitions. And then if you get some other lawyers up here, we could have a big old round table discussion about sovereignty. And uh, I forget, uh, um, Dr. Little Bear was saying you can talk at them until their eyes get glassy and nobody cares except you little group up here talking about sovereignty. Well, we're all showing off for each other and we're all arguing about that. But it's really not what matters. It matters like, how do you really know who you are? You know, I was talking with one of my brothers and I said, how do we know we're Oneidas? How do we know that? We know that even our uh, bitterest enemy, Oneida and detractor, he's Oneida too. How do we know that? We can't take that away from him. Some places do, they try to do a, a banishment and disenrollment and things like that. And that's really arguing about how you get a share of the, you know, the money. And uh, those are, are the kind of things that we argue about. Yes, you are, no, you're not, you know, like that. And it, it's an argument that never ends. It's a negative argument. You know, it's like, you aren't who you say you are. You aren't who you think you are. That's what somebody uh, the other day was saying is identity theft. On our reservation, we have a little township called Hobart, and we were there before they were, but they hate us. And so they do everything that they can against us, including taking away the reservation and just calling it Hobart. We live in the village of Hobart. And I said, I don't like living in the village of Hobart. I like living on the Oneida Reservation. That's why I'm home. I want to be in that place called Oneida. I says, you know what? That's identity theft. I says, they want to make us use their zip code. You say, well, it's just a zip code. What's wrong with that? And I says, what's wrong with it is, I says, on every map, it's identified as Hobart. You can't find a map that says Oneida except our map. They're trying to make us like uh, Back to the Future, you know, where the, where the guy starts uh, disappearing when you look at the photos until it never existed. They don't want us to exist, but we exist. And so we're fighting back on that. Those are the kind of things where identity theft is slow and imperceptible, but at the same time, it's very important. And so when people are speaking their language, that's a time, and they said that in um, uh, some of the, the places I've been to, uh, you take your language with you. Uh, Tom Porter, uh, my friend from uh, Ghana, Joe Halegi, uh, in New York, he said, you take your language with you. In the old days, he says, people were uh, advised when they go someplace to take your words with you. And if you have to talk with each other, you don't say, um, may I have uh, time for a caucus? You just start talking in your language. And if you've ever been in a place where you do that, you can see the power of the language because in English, the lawyers and the parliamentarians and everybody else has control of the meeting, even what you talk about, even when you can talk. But when you start talking Indian, they just really get quiet because they want you to shut up. They want you to quit talking with each other. They want all of us to quit talking with each other. You know, they just want us to be there for the photo op and look pretty and, you know, come up and say the uh, uh, oratorical words and things like that. But they don't want you to be alive and they don't want you to think about things. Well, one of the identity factors that have been repeated here is culturally, our language is something that identifies us more than anything. Sovereignty is being able to say who you are and why you're different from them. And we're not saying better than, we're only saying that we are who we are and we know why we're here and we understand our responsibilities to uh, future generations. And we appreciate the things that our ancestors have endured because we're enduring some of them now. And uh, something Chris said the other day, I was asking a question, and my question really was kind of colonially based. I says, well, I want everything to be perfect. I want everything where you can just take a pill and everything gets fixed. 
And he said, well, he says you go by domains, and the domains, the first time I really understood the idea of domains was in general I could describe it, but domains in the sense of fix what you can, do what you can, do it here. That's what I'm doing with my grandchildren, as good as I can, which I have to say is better than nothing, but uh, it's really uh, beautiful and reinforcing when my uh, grandkids call me Lock. So they know that that's not my name, that's my title, that's my relationship with them. And so we don't have to say we love each other because they don't know what that means yet, but they're coming to that place. So there's an emotional component of things that we have to include in our conversation. I don't like that. Not liking or negation is another part of speech. Arguing, exchanging ideas, that's kind of getting on that emotional level again. So we say these things and do these things uh, as ways of expressing our thoughts. I like this, I don't like this. I don't want to do that. I disagree with that. We have to say all those things. I even went further. I had a lesson from one of my teachers. I said, why are they always so goddamn jealous? And he says, I never say they're jealous. He says, he says, I say we're jealous. He says, because I'm one of them and I'm jealous. And that was like an insight it opened my eyes. I said, oh yeah, I said, I am too. Wagadun Gyohazi, I'm jealous. You know, and then what does even jealousy mean? So I have to go dig into that next and find out that deeper and deeper I go in and I find out, to me, what it means is being abandoned and disregarded and resentful and I'm fighting back. So my feeling is wanting to fight back. That's a normal feeling. So instead of saying, no, I'm not jealous, no, I'm not scared, denying your feelings is not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes you have to do that, but other times you have to open yourself up and say, I am jealous, I'm afraid, I don't know. And those are the kind of things that abstractly become also part of the language. So uh, sometime later on you'll get to see some of the, uh, the uh, survival phrases that we put in the uh, in the how to uh, how to uh, how do I say book and uh, in that we said stop help me slow down please um, you help him buckle up your you know when you get in the car tell the kids to buckle in all of you buckle in those kinds of words you can have lots of uh, conversation beginning with those things. You aren't making speeches about philosophy or about the existence of God or anything like that. You're not making a political speech and promising anything. You're just saying, what's going on today? Are you ready for school? Come and eat. Do this, do that. Those are the kind of things that are really based on the home and emotion and that feeling of mutuality and being accepted. That's a feeling of love and affection and caring for. And that's a, a very important part of this. Do, what do I do? Just hit. This is so cool. <laughs> so when you don't know what you're doing, you just push a button and see what happens. When I was first doing uh, uh, my computer, my, uh, I was looking at it and I was afraid that if I hit the wrong button, I erase everything and then I won't know where it's at. And my daughter's looking at me and she says, just push the button. I said, well, what if everything, and then she reaches over and pushes it before I could say, don't do that. And it just comes up and I said, oh, oh, okay, that's what I want. So, you know, like it's, it's helpful to have grandkids and young people around you that say, just set it up for me and tell me which button to push and, and I'll try to handle it from there. This was fun because my clerk, when she was doing this, she says, you know, we can make it come up so, you know, 
I says, nothing is worse to me than going to a, a presentation and somebody puts up a PowerPoint, then they read it all. I says, well, shit, I can read, you know. <laughs> let them have that thought themselves and let them boot, do what they want with it. So anyhow, we came up to this and one of the things that was important to me is understanding and talking with different teachers is the importance of listening. Not just hearing, but listening. Listening to what's going on. Like when you hear music, you can hear music, and then sometimes you hear music you like and then you listen. And then sometimes they're saying words and you listen to the words. Um, if you ever were around uh, codes and things like that, like Morse code when I was in the service, they tested us and see like, does anybody know what this means? Did it, did it, did it, did it? You know, well, one kid knew what it meant because he was trained, but it was a code that none of us knew. He could listen and understand, the rest of us couldn't. And so there's a lot of things that go on like that. Um, the importance of active listening, and I think one of the teachers said, um, when you're being recorded, and when we do recordings of uh, people talking, we want to have good equipment so we can listen exactly what they're saying. Because there's a lot of sounds in our languages that are not, uh, that don't appear in English or don't appear very much. And so one of the methodologies that uh, are being used at home is people just practicing the sounds that you never hear. And those kinds of sounds in English, they're, you just ain't gonna hear them. And then there's certain sounds in English that don't appear in our language. Well, being able to understand and comprehend includes listening carefully and listening to people speak carefully. So uh, active listening is uh, an important uh, part. When we started doing this, one of the things that I wanted to focus on was let us be honest and truthful with ourselves. Let us say, you know, like I had to be honest with myself when my grandkids are looking at me. They want something and I can't give it to them. I says, I have to be honest, I don't know this. I really don't know this. This is simple stuff, but I don't know it. And if I'm gonna continue on with this, I better get ready and learn how to do it. So, you know, like I'm such a slow learner. Uh, it takes me a while to figure that stuff out. And uh, we went through a bunch of questions, and these are just uh, kind of uh, off-the-wall questions that I ask myself and other people have asked themselves, and there's other things up here that you may want to ask yourself. You know, what am I doing? Is this really working? Am I even committed to this? You know, like there's times when I'm really working hard, and then there's other times when I'm kind of slacking, and I know I'm slacking. And then I start making excuses because I'm slacking. And then pretty soon I'm thinking, damn, it's been a couple weeks, you know, since I did this or that. It's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym every day, you feel good. But when you start slacking, pretty soon you've been off for a couple weeks and pretty soon you're gonna get back to it one of these days and then pretty soon you're in total denial. That don't matter, it ain't important. Well, some of the things that we wanna do in what we're doing is to be honest about it. Are the things that we're talking about important and do they really matter? And I think that um, they do matter or we wouldn't have started this in the first place, but we have to reinforce ourselves, and we have to be around people that uh, know things and know more than us. And we have to admit that when people say things like, are you fluent? Well, it kind of depends who you're talking to. You know, if I'm 10,000 miles from home and I'm pretty sure there's no Oneidas around, uh, I could say, I say, yes, I'm very fluent. <laughs> so we do everything in our language all the time, but when you get home and you start talking to people, well, when you talk to an elder or a speaker, they know right away how much you know. They just know it. They can hear it the way you talk. As soon as you start talking, they know that this guy really don't know much. And uh, the good part of it is if you're honest and truthful, and they say, but at least he's trying, and now he can be helped, and now he's willing to uh, listen. And I say this for, you know, like some of the uh, teachers who get critical, the speakers, I said, well, that's okay. I says, but don't be too critical. I mean, when you pick up a baby and they don't laugh and gurgle, you know, just because you want them to or smile, 
I said, you don't have the expectation that they're supposed to somehow make you happy. You're just there being careful because it's a natural instinct to love you know, something that's helpless, especially an infant, especially one of your own, especially somebody who's related to you, something that came out of you. It's a beautiful thing to be able to uh, hold that and, and to relate to it and not be able to talk. I think my grandkids like me best when I'm crawling around on the floor. Now I'm a cool grandpa. I remember when my grandma used to chase me around her chicken guts, you know, and she just cracked up. That was funny for her. <laughs> and we just like to be chased, you know, because I don't know, the guts weren't going to hurt because they were just guts. <laughs> but, you know, it was kind of weird the way she'd go around. Other times she'd say she'd get kind of peeved. Zatundega. I didn't know what that meant, you know, until I was about 40. You know, I, well, I, like I said, I was a slow learner. And uh, I was working and I says, what does that mean? You know, that means, did you hear me? Are you listening? You know, pay attention, you know, but I could tell by her peeved tone that she wasn't happy with me right now. Zatundega. You know, what's the matter with you? And uh, I said, that's what she said. And it only took me 40 years to get it. <laughs> but those are the kind of things where we want to be honest, like, I didn't know. You know, like sometimes she would say, oh, got und. I says, what does that mean? And she says, who said that? And I, I said, <laughs> I said, you said that. <laughs> She thought nobody was listening. <laughs> well, when they're, yesterday when they're talking about like, uh, you know, people learn swear words and things like that. Well, that's not exactly a swear word, but it's a annoyed kind of an exclamation. She says, that, well, it means like, must be a snake or, you know, like something that startles you or something like that. It was funny, you know, because she would own up. She was, you know, like my fun grandma. My other grandma didn't talk to me like that, but this grandma was engaging. And uh, it wasn't a lesson directly, but it was teaching me something about uh, your own expression. And she didn't chase me out of the house because I was not behaving. She would... Uh, show me that that's not a proper way to behave or that's not something you should be doing right now. That's a communication. So some of the communications are about words and some of them are signals of certain, uh, certain kinds of behavior. So these hard questions um, that we uh, asked ourselves are something that I would encourage you to just, you know, you don't have to wait for a linguist to come in and evaluate your program what you have to do is sit down yourself and say, are we having success with this? Are we actually producing a speaker someplace along the line? And you do, you see them. They'll come in and they'll say something and uh, uh, it sounds like you haven't had a lesson on this, but you say it perfectly. So I remember this old lady says to me, she says, you said that just right pat myself on the back. I says, wow. And then she says, we're in front of people. She says, and if Jerry can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the kind of things that, you know, you don't know what you're doing and you do it and you did it right. That's a good thing. That's part of the magic that I think comes from our language and learning our language and being able to get into that worldview of a different way of looking at things and a different way of relating to things. Now, some of the stuff that we do at ILI, uh, we do workshops on desks, desktop publishing and uh, doing video clips. And uh, I went through a couple of those classes. And they're so interesting because people would come in and they were really turned on to what they were doing. You didn't have to, uh, they wouldn't come up and say, what should I do? They would come up and say, 
I want to do this, you know, and then we'd show them how to write a script and squeeze it down into a two or three minute piece so that somebody could hear what they did. And while they're doing that, anybody who's done any of that, excuse me, knows that when you're preparing your little clip or your little story, whatever it is, you're really focused. You're focused on what you want to do and you're focused on how you want to say it and you want it to be right because you're going to show it to people. That's good stuff and, and when we were doing that, uh, sometimes in the old days we'd say, well, we want to write a book and then we want to send it away and get it published and then we have to pay for it and all that. Well, uh, our team came together and uh, they showed us how to do it. Well, you could do that on your computer. Well, you don't have to ask anybody for permission. Well, you can do it right now. Well, you can produce this in two or three days. When you get tired of it, you can do a new one. That was the beauty of those kinds of things to say like, you could tell a story, you could tell a joke, or you could tell a little biography, or you could give some kind of um, uh, process for doing something, and you don't really have to show it to anybody unless you feel like it. So you have lots of control, and the beauty of it is just being able to do it. And you get tired of it and you move it along because all you people that are artists know very well that when you start getting to the end of your work, you're already thinking about the next thing you're going to do. That's the creative process. We're always thinking ahead to the next thing. So this self-developed uh, materials are very important and very useful in places where there's not a lot of money and where there's uh, good speaking resources and you don't have time to be waiting and engaging your students and doing some of these projects is a, a good way to uh, uh, communicate and uh, use the language. We talked about innovative projects, things that aren't happening, you know, like the tribe puts on a program and they're funded by ANA or somebody else and they have, you know, certain project goals and things that they have to accomplish and that's one thing. And then we have immersion camps and, but there's a lot of other things that can be done too. We can have boot camps, we can have homeschooling, we can have uh, like the card games or table games I mentioned, even coloring. Maxine and I did a coloring project long time ago. It was a creation story. And uh, the artist had done 80 drawings, line drawings in black and white, and we just got a whole bunch of crayons and markers and things like that, and we just sat around for weeks coloring these things, and we were laughing and joking, hey, this one looks like Ralph. <laughs> Don't tell Ralph. <laughs> Say, how come my guy's pink? You know, like it was easy to do trees and rocks and grounds and grass and things like that and sky, but you know, when you get down to people, it's hard to get people, you know, get them the right color and then to get them the same color in the next thing and to get them the same color. We got guys from, they were purple and some of them were bright pink and everything, but it was fun, it was something to do. Being around doing something like that is uh, uh, something too. I've been talking about philosophy for the whole time, so I'm gonna say. The stages of acquisition, I've kind of gone through that too. I think it's emotionally based. I think that's one of the things that it starts off with. And I think that there's uh, listening and active listening so that we separate out what we're hearing from the background. But it doesn't mean the background isn't important. I was reading about this uh, woman who records background for movies. So, you know, like in a restaurant or something like that, she'll just uh, uh, tape a whole bunch of, you know, like the sounds that people make at dinner and when they're eating, just the conversations. You don't really hear anybody's conversation, you just hear words here and there, uh, the clinking of glasses and things like that, that's important. She sold that, that gives a reality to some of the scenes that we're doing. Am I out of time? Okay, I'm getting out of time, they told me. That's good. <laughs> uh, 
Anyhow, she made that a business where, you know, where somebody's telling a story and if somebody goes into a restaurant or somebody goes to, you know, like background noise. Well, background noise is part of immersion. We're immersed, but we're immersed in English. You know, we have to say like, well, don't worry about English. English will take care of itself. We don't have to really worry about anything. What we have to do is recreate the experience of immersion. And um, what that one of those ladies was saying, you know, when they take them out of the take them out of the school and take them someplace where there's uh, no other distractions and there's no other noise and you just have to be in the language. Um, it's really intimidating until you finally, like, I don't know if anybody's ever gone to jail. Um, I've gone to jail. And, uh, you know, when you go to jail, you know, you finally have to realize that you're not getting out of here until somebody else opens the door and lets you go. So you're here for whatever duration it has to be. And I think in some sense when we take people out of the classroom or take their minds out of something else, we're trying to hold back that wall of English that doesn't want anything else to come in. That's what we're doing. And so uh, listening becomes important. Um, the various uh, atmospheres that we're in ourselves, including the atmospheres that we can control. And like the teacher I was telling you about who stayed in when my language teacher came in for the uh, daycare, um, she was a white woman and she learned how to talk. And we knew that she knew how to talk uh, because we walked in on her sometimes and she, we busted her talking Indian. That was really cool, and she was good, too. And some of the Indian teachers get mad at her because, like, well, that's ours. We shouldn't be learning it. I said, well, why don't you stay in here instead of taking a smoke break when the teacher comes in and the speaker comes in? Well, I didn't say that. I just thought it. But <laughs> <laughs> I said, so, you know, like, it's all emotional. And she wasn't a person that was saying, like, I know more than you about you. She was just doing what she did in school. She was taking care of the kids. She paid attention to them because she cared about them. And she cared about this old man. And this old man cared about her. They just talked. That's what they were doing. They were talking. So we're you know, into this, um, uh, the kinds of speech, uh, something I got from um, our board member. What was her name from Oklahoma? She's gone now. Yeah, Margaret Malden. And she was a language teacher, and I heard her speaking once, and she said, well, there was different kinds of language. There's conversation and persuasion and oratory and litany. I've gone through them. But, uh, you know, that struck me. I said, yeah, there is. There is. You know, like I'm doing something now, which is not exactly conversation, but I hope it leads to some. And other times when I don't know if I'm persuading you and I'm not asking you to vote for me or anything like that, and this is not a prayer session, so I'm not being religious about things I don't know anything about. But all these things come from conversation. That's what I think. I mean, I don't know if anybody agrees with me, and I actually kind of don't care unless they can think of a better way to explain it, but to me, if you can't converse at home, well, everything else you do, um, is kind of diminished by the fact that you can't bring it all the way from home, which is, you know, yourself and in your heart and in your thoughts and everything that you have. Somebody said we should have dictionaries, and I said, dictionaries are good. I said, but dictionaries are for reference, and a dictionary doesn't do anybody any good if you can't talk. So, you know, like the real dictionary is in your head. You know, like when you're just stranded and there's nothing there but you, you have to go with what you got. And sometimes, like with my grandkids, I didn't have anything. And at other times, I'm uh, ready to go and I'm prepared for what I'm doing. Now, this, uh, I want to show you something about, uh, and I'll end it off with this too. Uh, 
There was a couple things that I wanted to show that showed the diversity of languages. I couldn't get one. One was on the third rock from the sun in which uh, Tommy is arguing with the old guy. Um, anyhow, they're speaking in different languages and they're like competing. And they're speaking Chinese and they're speaking Russian and they're speaking German and they're going back and forth. And I was thinking, wow, man, that's talent. I didn't think they could speak the language, but they were prepared to give that exchange. You know, it's like, you can say anything you want. I'm, I'm understanding it and I'll give it back to you. So they're doing this back and forth. It was pretty amazing. Couldn't find that one. It kind of reminded me of something I've heard people say, like you have to learn your language so that when you go to heaven that the creator will understand you. And I thought, wait a minute, if it's a creator, I'm pretty sure he understands everything I can say <laughs> or you can say. I said, what about mute people? They, said, they can't talk at all. I says, I'm pretty sure God can, you know, communicate with them too. Uh, it isn't to criticize the idea, it's to give it, you know, the idea of when you know everything, then uh, you don't have to be explained. And uh, I think that nobody knows everything. You know, we just share these little bits and pieces of what we know. And uh, what I've tried to do today or this morning or what I've aimed at was to try and share the, what I consider it's magic of awareness. How do you even know, like I was saying with my brother, how do we know where Oneida is? I mean, we just believe it. We believe it. And how do we know they are who they say they are? Because they believe it. We accept their words that they believe something, but sometimes you know things and then you become aware. And so I wanna share this little piece of something that I got out of watching um, The Simpsons. And this is about language and, <laughs> Alex, show me which, see, I need the guy to show me which button to push, this is embarrassing. <laughs> He was an exchange student. You're a policeman, aren't you? Excusez-moi, je ne parle pas anglais. But y you gotta help me. These two guys I'm staying with, they work me day and night. They don't feed me. They make me sleep on Tiens, the... Tiens, petit garçon, voilà un bonbon. I, I, I don't want a piece of candy. I need your help. Come on, mister. Can you help me? Je suis désolé. J'aimerais vraiment pouvoir vous aider. Oh, forget it. I am so stupid. Anybody could have learned this dumb language by now. Here I've listened to nothing but French for the past two mois. Et je ne sais pas ce mot. Hey! Monsieur pas français, mon tout Incroyable! Hey, monsieur, aidez-moi! C'est du type nous faut travailler jour et nuit. Il ne me donne pas à manger. Il nous faut dormir par tard. Ils mettent un antifrice dans le vin et ils ont donné mon chapeau rouge à l'un. De l'antifrice dans le vin Oh, mais c'est sérieux, ça. Viens avec moi, fiston. Tu n'as plus rien à craindre. Mon sauveteur, vous aurez toujours une place dans mon cœur. Dani Tonio Leva Galiwat Guinigi Nati and Galiwayan Dakwa. Nenis Galiwat Skana, wait what no duni. I'd what one duck. I said, let's speak our language now. <laughs> 